Um, I was I was asked and invited to present a, a chip in the box case. It's it's nothing too complex. It's nothing too too. Um, uh, it's, it's it's quite a straightforward case. But I just wanted to highlight my practice in London and some of the things that I see as relevant for for chip PCI in 2022. So if I just quickly introduce myself. Um, I work at the Royal Free Hospital in London, so I'm based in North London. We're one of seven tertiary centres in London, and um, it's an old hospital. It's been there since um, 1828, so we're approaching our 200-year anniversary. At my particular centre, we do 1,600 PCIs a year, of which 450 are primary angioplasties. I know by Indian standards, that's actually pretty low volume, but given that there are seven tertiary centres within London, it's divided across the seven of us. And my role there is I'm, I'm the cath lab director and I'm one of the interventional cardiologists. So when, when thinking about chip PCI in, in the current era, um, we've, all, we've all seen this uh, pyramid of PCI complexity. We all are very familiar with this. But the one thing that's clear to me is that chip PCI still remains a poorly defined and studied area. I think the Americans have tr uh, claimed that they coined the phrase, and I'm sure they have, but it's still not something that's well defined actually what does constitute chip PCI. Now, it's fair to say that globally the techniques are well established. What's been presented this morning is very clear that India is well ahead of the curve um, compared to other countries in terms of the techniques and the, and the skills required for chip PCI. But what I really think for me now is that whilst we're good you know, as a global community at delivering this type of procedure, there are still a lot of areas of focus. It's, it's choosing the correct patient, looking at the outcomes, not just about the procedural feasibility, but more importantly, is looking at procedural efficiency, looking at workflow and looking at cost. And I think these are things that are really, really important in the modern era of chip PCI. And hopefully my case is going to highlight some of these areas and, and we can hopefully have a slight discussion about this later on. So I'm going to move on to presenting my case now. And this is a case of a 77-year-old lady who came to see me in uh, my clinic, in my office. She had a history of three-vessel CABG in 2010, so 12 years previously. Her background comorbidity includes hypertension and dyslipidemia. Since 2010, she'd actually been quite well, but from the beginning of this year, she'd started to experience very classical stable angina with CCS class two symptoms. She was already on two anti-anginals, and um, I introduced, also I up-titrated her doses when I saw her in clinic and planned for a coronary angiogram directly rather than proceed with a stress test in view of her very typical symptoms and known ischemic heart disease with previous CABG. So I'll go on to the relevant pictures in a second, but sufficient to say that her coronary angiogram showed severe native vessel disease. Her two vein grafts were patent, but interestingly, her lima to her LAD was functionally occluded. And if I just come into here now, we've got a, um, a PA cranial view of the LAD here. We can see before the dye goes in, there's an area of calcification in the mid vessel, and there appears to be a severe stenosis there. But there's a lot of overlap of small branches. It's not entirely clear um, how severe the stenosis angiographically is in that mid LAD. Various angles didn't resolve the anatomy as well as I would have hoped. And you can see that the lemon graft is functionally included. So this is likely to have been quite soon postoperatively. And assuming her symptoms have now developed with progressive disease in her native LAD. So having viewed this angiogram, the next step, and certainly for my practice, would be that we have no evidence of ischemia. So I proceeded to on-table physiological assessment. The FFR in the LAD was positive at 0.74. And I proceeded to PCI of the native LAD to treat her stable angina. Now, on the angiogram, we saw that there was diffuse mid-vessel disease, um, which looked severe, and the angiographic appearance of calcification. I usually, when I see calcium on the angiogram, would undertake an OCT study. And we've been now, for the last almost 18 months, been using the Ultrion OCT system, which um, is unrivaled in its detection of calcium by AI. And I undertook PCI using, you know, what we kind of is a standard chip technique now using this MLD Max workflow. So for those familiar or not familiar with the Ultron system, I'm just showing the initial um, pullback study. Now the Ultron is slightly different compared to Aptiview. We image from proximal to distal here. So the run starts at the proximal in the, uh, the end of the run in the left main stem. 
On the right hand side in the axial view, we can see the axial lumen, but what we can additionally see here is the AI detection of calcium. On the axial view, in the circumference of that view, we can see an orange line which depicts the detection of calcium. And on this particular run, I've set the threshold to uh, display anything with an arc of more than 120 degrees. So you can see there is a fair bit of calcium, but it looks pretty eccentric. I'm going to freeze on a few images now and just uh, show you specific features that were relevant to this case. So on one particular area here, we can see that there's eccentric calcium, 194 degree arc, and it's deep ball. It's more than 1,000 microns deep. So this is eccentric, certainly not something that would have fit, uh, would have fit with the disrupt CAD um, recruitment. So something that we would have maybe not thought of any advanced calcium modification here, but it is eccentric. But what's more interesting is that just beyond the area of eccentricity, so more in the mid-vessel, there is the appearance of calcific nodules and the eruptive type of calcific nodules. And you can see there's quite a few of these nodules throughout, the, um, throughout that area just beyond the mid-vessel. So we can take this through to, and now we've, we've made a decision for PCI here. We can take this through to the sizing tab. What we can see are three axial views on the screen here. On the right-hand side, I have set a distal marker, and that's the distal marker on my lumen profile there. We can see in the dotted lines, we can see the detection of the EEL. So that's given me a vessel size of 3.06 millimeter diameter. And we can see that the lumen size is 2.43 millimeters. Now, on the left-hand side, I've set a proximal marker. And on the axial view, we can see some EEL detection, but insufficient to give me a vessel size. We can see the lumen size is 2.81 millimeters. And on a manual measurement, um, estimating where the um, EEL is, we could estimate that the uh, vessel diameter was 3.5 millimeters here. And on the bottom of the screen, as we see with AptiView, we've also got a length measurement now, so we can see that this is a 38 millimeter length lesion. So the next question is, how am I going to tackle this procedure? We've seen that there's evidence of nodular calcium. We've seen that there's evidence of eccentric calcium. There is um, a, a thought process that eccentric calcium can be modified with a combination of non-compliant balloons and cutting balloons. Nodular calcium is a little bit more difficult to modify, and there's no real consensus on what the best way to modify that is. In personal experience, I find cutting balloons are often not useful. If you're looking in 2D angiography with a non-compliant balloon, you can often feel that you've expanded, but uh, the module may not be visible on the particular view that you have. I took the decision on this patient to use shockwave IVL therapy for the entire lesion, so both in the areas of eccentric, eccentric calcium but also in the areas of nodular calcium. And in a few slides, I'll come on to the reason why I did that. I predilated this after, so sorry, I, I used 30 shocks in the uh, eccentric part of the calcium in the more proximal end of the lesion and 60 consecutive shocks in the area of nodular calcium. Just to ensure uniform expansion, I then took a 3.0 millimeter non-compliant balloon and predilated further, and there was good expansion of the balloon in different angles, and then went on to deploy a 3.0 by 38 millimeter Zion struggling stent, and postulated the front end with a 3.5 millimeter non-compliant balloon based on the measurements I'd made with Ultrion. So what I'm showing now is an OCT run taken post IVL treatment. So we can see that um, there's areas of calcium modification. There are also areas of dissection in the vessel as well. And I'm going to freeze on a few frames now just to show you the areas of modification and what we've seen. So this is the area of eccentric calcium in the more proximal part of the lesion. A very clear modification here. So technically, this would have not been a disrupt CAD type patient based on the OCT imaging, but certainly there is modification of the eccentric calcium. And you can see further cracks there, and typical what we see when we've, we've done this in more, more concentric type calcium, but we've seen this in eccentric calcium here as well. Now, the nodules are slightly more interesting to me, and we can see that the nodules have been completely obliterated by the shockwave IVL. So there's 60 consecutive shots delivered to this area, and there are cracks running all the way through these eruptive nodules in several areas. So after deploying the stent, a further OCT run here. And again, with the Ultrion software, we're using the Illumium 3 methodology here. We get a stent expansion and an MSA based on the tapered reference method. 
And we can see in this particular vessel, the minimum expansion was 93% and the MSA was 4.25 millimeters. So on the left now, we have the pre-PCI angiogram, and on the right, we have the post-PCI angiogram. We have excellent um, angiographic appearance, and we've already confirmed this with OCT. So just for me now to summarize why I made certain decisions in this, in this particular case, and particularly here, which may be slightly controversial, is why I use shockwave IVL in this particular case, given that none of the trials have specifically looked at this so far. I undertook my first shockwave case in 2016. That was my first clinical case. And my indication for use was for lesion preparation and severely calcified coronary artery disease. I used a disrupt one CAD, uh, sorry, disrupt CAD one definition of severe calcification that's more than a 270 degree arc on intravascular imaging or the angiographic appearance of severe calcification before contrast injection. At this time, I also undertook several rotor shock cases whereby um, there was a large burden of calcific plaque, and the science to me felt that if you ablated some of the material before using shockwave, you would get better stent expansion. Otherwise, if you just shockwave, you're going to just trap a load of calcified plaque behind the stent, and that may restrict uh, stent expansion. Now, this was back in 2016, and uh, with all new technologies, our experience evolves. And my evolution has been that all of the cases I did with Shockwave were OCT optimized using a stent expansion workflow. And the observations I had from this early experience were that you never just had one morphology of calcified plaque. You often had various morphologies within the lesion. And this is, uh, this is a good example of the case I just presented. So we had eccentric and nodular calcium there, but I've often seen concentric, eccentric, and nodular calcium all within the same lesion. And I've also found that actually when you treat the entire length of the target lesion, rather than just the area of severest calcification, the area of concentric calcification, it facilitates subsequent stent delivery and expansion. OCT assessment after treating with shockwave has shown me that actually all the morphologies get modified, not just concentric. And excellent stent calcification can be achieved even with a high burden of calcific plaque so actually, the whole rotor shock thing may not be necessary. We've got some data to help us with this. This was presented last year at TCT by Ziad Ali, and this is looking at the pooled data across the disrupt CAD studies. And this first slide here just shows that with various arcs of calcium, excellent stent expansion was achieved, and there was modification with IVL. And similarly, there's good expansion and modification of calcific nodules with IVL. So if we move now to current practice, my 2022 practice, my use of IVL is preemptive and not reactive. So I don't wait to see a lesion that doesn't expand an undilatable lesion. I use OCT to plan all of my cases. Um, if there's angiographic or CTCA evidence of calcification before the procedure, we additionally do encounter an unexpected undilatable lesion, in which case I will use shockwave, but most of my use is preemptive now. I use it to treat all morphologies of calcification not just concentric. So if I see something on intravascular imaging, I'll treat the entire calcified segment regardless of the morphology. And really now for me, the, the decision for shockwave IVL is, in calcified disease is my first interventional device. And certainly in the UK, there has become a mantra of if you can cross it, shock it. Our use of rotablation, rotational atherectomy has significantly reduced in the UK since the introduction of shockwave, but there are those lesions that are uncrossable and they will need rotational atherectomy in the, as a first interventional device. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep Kalra. Uh, it was an excellent case, good demonstration of uh, artificial intelligence of the new OCT machine. And I want to ask you one question. Do you regularly use, uh, uh, are you almost given up rotablation for all the calcified lesions? Are you using only shockwave or are you using it, both the modalities? So my personal, you? yeah, so, my, my, so certainly within my center, I take on a lot, a lot the large burden of the kind of the chip PCI, the surgical turndown PCI I take on. And my rotational atherectomy use was somewhere about 15%. It's now dropped to 5% of my cases. 
Shockwave is, is, is my go-to device. So if I can cross the lesion and it's calcified, I will use Shockwave as my first interventional device. Wonderful case and a good demonstration of the utility of uh, shockwave. Uh, but would shockwave uh, usage actually bring down the usage of rota, or actually you need rota to get to that point of using shockwave because the balloon profile is quite uh, big? So. Before shockwave came about, and we we knew we had a heavily calcified lesion, we I would always I would always use rotational atherectomy to modify this before I I tried to deploy a stent or use non-compliant balloons. I would never try and balloon a lesion and then use rotation because you really lose once you've squashed the plaque out of the way, you lose the benefit of rotational atherectomy, and sometimes the burr will just pass through rather than actually modify it. But a lot of those cases now where a shockwave balloon will pass through, I use that as my first interventional device now because stent expansion is is excellent after using shockwave. We don't need to always use rotational atherectomy to get good stent expansion. Uh, 